the Vietnam War and the push for US involvement was a result of the Gulf of Tonkin incident. A lie. The Iraq War famously is a result of lies. Wars in Somalia are a result of lies. The Second World War and the German invasion of Poland was a result of carefully constructed lies. That is war by media. Let us ask ourselves of the complicit media, which is the majority of the mainstream press, what is the average death count attributed to each journalist? Karras uh, from The Third Man, and at the very top was uh, Julian Assange uh, at an anti-war demonstration in uh, London back in 2010. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Randy Credico, Randy Credico, live on the fly here on 99.5 FM in New York City, WBAI.org. And if you want to support the station, you go to give to WBAI.org, and you should support, you should support the station because uh, it's got, it's free speech. And uh, we got great programming seven days a week. Uh, this is also going to be part of the Assange series, uh, Assange Countdown to Freedom, which we started here exactly four years ago this day with Julian Assange and uh, with John Pilger. So uh, today, last week, we had uh, Max Blumenthal, the uh, editor of uh, The Gray Zone, uh, the co-host of uh, Moderate Rebels and the author of millions of books, including his latest, Management of Savagery. Welcome back, Max. Good to be back. It's always good. I, hadn't, I haven't had you on WBAI uh, for like four years uh, until last week. Now I got you two in a row. I got a lot of making up to do. Uh, Max, um, you, uh, you appeared at the event uh, a year ago uh, for Assange at City College in, in, uh, in Queens, and you've done a lot of uh, work uh, on the Assange case. You've uh, unveiled some very uh, important uh, information, uh, beginning with UC Global. Um, give us a little, uh, in a nutshell, the uh, UC Global spying uh, scandal that you unveiled. Well, we've, I think we've talked about it before on your show, but this was a Spanish security firm that was contracted by the CIA. It's obvious now that it was contracted by the CIA. The CIA used, this is Mike Pompeo's CIA, really in their first major action, charted out by Pompeo in his first speech as CIA director to take down WikiLeaks uh, they recruited this um, director of this pretty marginal Spanish security firm that happened to have the contract at the Ecuadorian embassy where Assange had taken sanctuary and was seeking uh, permanent asylum somewhere. And they had been contracted by the Ecuadorian government, but their director came to Vegas. He was recruited at the hotel or the convention hall of Trump's largest donor, the late Sheldon Adelson, the you know, pro-Israel warlord. And basically Sheldon Adelson's Las Vegas Sands became a pass-through for the CIA, like sort of a third party. And the CIA got access to all the embassy's cameras and began running all kinds of black operations against Assange, even proposing to assassinate him, poison him, uh, all the journalists who went there, you, everybody was surveilled. They had their phones opened, personal details stolen by these CIA contractors. This is, should have been a huge scandal. I mean, you had New York Times and Washington Post reporters who had their devices open. And they instead just report the security state side because they know what side the, you know, their, you know, their bread is buttered. So 
I, I exposed all this because I got documents from this from the Spanish high court. I mean, the court wasn't providing me documents for participants in the trial because the director of UC Global was put on trial for embezzlement, a violation of attorney client privilege because he was spying on Assange and his lawyers and uh, robbery. I mean, I can go on and on about the amount of alleged crimes that were committed in the course of this CIA surveillance black operation, but the Spanish high court, the same court that prosecuted Pinochet was not having any of it. And they put him on trial. These documents included his texts, chats, uh, emails, and they came straight to me because the rest of the media didn't want to report on it. For some reason, they didn't think this was a gigantic scandal. They're too busy reporting on like Navalny's alleged poisoning and not the CIA sending its agents to poison the leading dissident in the West. This all led straight to Assange's arrest and prosecution, and now the U.S. is seeking to extradite him. So this is, I think, what we were able to do at the gray zone was show the world what Julian Assange was up against while he was living in this kind of three-room annex. Yeah, you know, you... Um... You wrote two articles on it, uh, and you can get them at Gray Zone, uh, thegrayzone.com. Am I correct? It's thegrayzone.com, and that's correct. with a, a gray, not with an e. Uh, yep, you got it. Those were the rebels. The other rebels were the grays in the South, uh, and you're a rebel, moderate rebel. I don't know where you got moderate. There's nothing moderate about you. Know, let me just this. Well, the CIA uh, called it its uh so-called freedom fighters in Syria, moderate rebels. So it's just kind of a play on their terminology. Oh, okay. That's the same thing that John Pilger uses. Uh, let, we'll meet again at the end of um, the, his uh, War on China uh, documentary. And it's um, uh, Vera Lynn used to sing that to troops uh, during World War II, a British singer who just died at one, age 103. Uh, Max, I I is it surprising to you that the Biden administration is continuing uh, to fight to get uh, Assange uh, extradited uh, to this country. They just filed a brief, uh, you know, uh, they, they appealed it. And uh, so they're going forward with this operation. What do you make of that? Yeah, this is part of the overall continuum between the Trump and Biden administrations on virtually everything related to foreign policy, what's considered national security, although it doesn't make US citizens any more secure, but basically the priorities of the military intelligence apparatus remain virtually unchanged, although the tactics with which the Biden administration goes about it might be slightly different. So the appeal of the British decision not to extradite Assange stands. And at um, the law journal of the university of pennsylvania my alma mater um not that i really feel any loyalty to that institution or the quaker brand but uh at the law journal recently actually it was this month someone named george w croner published an article croner is a think tank fellow at the uh, Foreign Policy Research Institute, a neoconservative think tank in Philadelphia, just founded during the Cold War. A bunch, it's just filled with, you know, the most hardline authoritarians in the U.S. think tank world. And he argued that the Biden administration should not give up on the appeal and pursuing Assange because of what it means for the press. And he, this is what he said, Assange is an indictment may signal that the government no longer considers the media immune from the consequences that the espionage statutes, at least on their face, contemplate for such conduct. In other words, what this US think tank authoritarian was saying is that the Biden administration needs to send a signal to other journalists who cover national security matters that they should not ever think about publishing classified material lest they too be prosecuted and thrown in a maximum security prison for the rest of their lives. And that Assange should indeed be made uh, an example 
for the rest of the media, what happens when you go against the CIA or the FBI and the rest of the security state that prevails in the West? Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm amazed that I have not seen anything of late uh, from uh, MSNBC uh, or um, CNN. The only person is on Fox, and that's, that's um, uh, Tucker Carlson, who I don't like in particular, but he has been very good on this subject. But nobody else in, in, on the other networks particularly are out there uh, circling the wagons uh, for Julian Assange, it's like uh, they're circling the fiery squad because what's the consequences for them, Max, do you think if, if Assange is uh, extradited to this country and sent away? Well, for them, it's like, uh, it, it reminds me of the way that so many Republicans responded to the Patriot Act after 9-11, which is like, well, they're not going to surveil me. They're going after a bunch of Muslim bad guys. So how's this going to affect me? I don't care about the Constitution except uh, as long as they don't take my guns away, you know? So they, these opportunistic hacks who basically play the role of stenographers for power at MSNBC or any other outlet, they're not threatened by this. They don't report on sensitive US national security matters in a critical way. What they do is they amplify the narratives of the US national security state and they focus on dissidents in other countries where they have no power to change anything. So that's, that's the new role of the national security correspondent in US or Western media as a whole. I mean, we've been revealing so many whistleblower scandals at the gray zone because and the rest of the media, including the intercepts just sort of given up on this stuff. I mean, the OPCW whistleblowers have been had their report on the Duma Syria deception in 2018, which was a pro-war deception designed to frame the Syrian government for a chemical attack to justify Western airstrikes and missile strikes against Syria. And we have the investigators who went to the ground on behalf of the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, having their report suppressed, and now they're under attack by US government funded outlets like Bellingcat, and the BBC, they're just being smeared. And what the Bellingcat and the BBC are demonstrating is the role that they that national security reporters are supposed to play, which is to cover up these kinds of scandals on behalf of NATO, on behalf of the US government, not to actually scrutinize their government. What they're doing is afflicting the, the afflicted and comforting the comfortable. And we're doing the opposite and it, it feels like, uh, you know, sometimes it feels like we're almost alone sometimes. I mean, we're part of a, an alternative media. Yeah, and you certainly are. I'm, I must say the gray zone and you have been getting praise, uh, you know, from just about everybody that I know uh, for, for your work, whether it be John Pilger uh, uh, citing the gray zone, Stefania Morizzi, both who have been uh, mainstays on this show, uh, citing the uh, courage and the fortitude uh, of, of uh, the gray zone uh, for coming up. Nobody else is really doing it. And the intercept, of course, it's, it's the difference between um, um, Das Capital and uh, Look Magazine between you and <laughs> John is with you. So they're, they're lightweight, but they, you know, they, you, you are self-funded. Uh, you're not funded by um, big donors. Uh, some of these other outlets are that we, that have moderated their views, uh, get money from big donors. And we know it's an auctioneer uh, who doesn't pay his uh, workers very well uh, from eBay, who's uh, funding, um, uh, the yeah. Internet. yeah, but they do some good work, but you know, but they but they've know. given up on their mission, which started out as a mission to scrutinize the national security state. And they had the Snowden files, those have been disappeared. And yeah, Piero Midiar, who's there, I don't know that this is why this took place, but Piero Midiar is someone who was blessed by the you know, U.S. Agency for International Development and so many other elements within this U.S. regime change apparatus as a billionaire who could be 
a force multiplier for U.S. empire, like other billionaires have his like the role that other billionaires have historically played: Henry Luce, George Soros, um, the Rockefellers. So there are priorities there. And the journalists there say, "Well, we don't. Omidyar doesn't have any say in what we do." I don't totally buy that, but whatever happened, whatever the reason was, they're, they've abandoned their original mission. And you know we have taken up the mantle of doing what we think journalists are supposed to do, which is to scrutinize the powerful people in our midst, in our country, where we ha actually have the power to change things. And I think about John Pilger as a model this is, but John Pilger is someone who actually was able to have a voice in mainstream media in his time and was able to get his documentaries produced uh, in the UK or Australia, whereas we have to crowdfund everything. Um, so on the one hand, media is more free, but on the other hand, the way that speech is managed in the West um, is generally through soft coercion, where the dissident voices are marginalized, they'll be attacked, uh, the algorithm on YouTube or Google or Twitter will suppress us. But if we reach the status of Julian Assange, I mean, we have to remember 10 years ago, Julian Assange was everywhere he spoke, he was followed by cameras and microphones. He was an international celebrity who was exposing the inner workings of the empire that if we reach that status, that soft coercion turns to a hard fist. And yeah. that is really the, the lesson that's being taught to journalists as the media shrinks and contracts. Well, look at the daring stuff that, and I know you're rocking a lot of boats and rattling a lot of cages, uh, the, the gray zone. And you must look at this at, at Assange, the situation that he's in. People uh, give you information, they gave you the documents from UC Global, uh, but do you, you guys uh, talk about this, uh, the fear that you may uh, get uh, harassed on the same level as Assange? I mean, I've been arrested for, uh, on false charges concocted by the, a Venezuelan opposition funded by the U.S. government that we were scrutinizing. I think we played a leading role in discrediting Juan Guaido's operation. And I had police show up at my house last year or uh, October, 2019, five months after this false charge was concocted, somehow a warrant was enacted against me and I was thrown in jail for two days and I faced phony assault charges until uh, they were dropped a few weeks later. And uh, you know, a friend of mine faced the same charges and I don't know if he, he was going to trial until they decided to arrest me. So I saw that as an act of intimidation. I would like to know what the process was that led to my arrest because this was this was a USA versus Max Blumenthal case but of course it's nothing that it's nothing like what Julian Assange encountered we have to really step back from the media from the from the noise in the media to understand how absurd the prosecution of Julian Assange is that all he did was provide a blockchain style secure platform for publishing documents that other so that other newspapers including the new york times and washington post could have access to them and they proceeded to report it and what what wikileaks was doing was the bread and butter of national security reporting for years including during the 2016 campaign and Honestly, I really have to question if Hillary Clinton had won, whether Assange would have been prosecuted, just as we wouldn't be hearing anything about Russian interference. So much of this has to do with the mainstream media turning on Assange because they blamed him for Trump's victory. Right. And that's the, that's the deal. It's a pincer move. You got conservatives that don't like him. Uh, because he exposed war crimes and you got liberals don't like that, don't like him because they think he handed 
uh, Trump uh, the victory in 2016. We only got a few minutes left, Max. Some of the things that he would be covering uh, today that would be very helpful in tandem with your uh, with the gray zone would be uh, on Bolivia. Uh, you've, you've done plenty of work in Bolivia. You and Anya Parampil have been down there. Uh, you've done plenty of work on Venezuela. I'm sure we'd have more information on Venezuela if he was around. Iran, uh, you, we'd have more. Syria, the bombing recently. Uh, and of course, uh, China and Russia. These are six hot points uh, in the world that the neoconservatives in, in the administration, and I, I start at the top with Tony Blinken, are bent on uh you know regime change in most of those countries yep yep i mean i think you know one of the the, the greatest values of wikileaks was to understand the info ops the information operations that the u.s government has deployed and how they work through third-party cutouts whether it's strat for or ngos to plant stories in the media that advance their agenda and so much of what we're hearing about western china and the Uyghurs appears to be stories that have been planted by U.S. intelligence to use human rights as a weapon against China. Brian Hook, who is an advisor to the Trump administration, actually wrote a memo that's been declassified for the State Department in 2017, where he said, you know, we might have some moral concerns about human rights, but that's not really what we're interested in. We want to use human rights to extract concessions and advance our own interests against countries where we seek re regime change. And that's, that's what's happening. And I would love to know how the sausage is being made, although we've kind of figured it out at the gray zone using our own sources and public sources. A and uh, this reminds me distinctly of the way that the Syria deception, the information operations around Syria to stimulate support among the American public for Syrian regime change was implemented for the past few years. It's, 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 I mean, you just, you can look at WikiLeaks and learn so much about how the deceptions and coercions are designed and then apply it to everything you see play out today on the pages of the Washington Post and New York Times or on CNN. So it's really illustrative and we owe that to Julian Assange. And if we do owe that to him, then we owe him our support and our solidarity. All right. Uh, I, I got to end it on that note. That was great, Max. That was the quickest 24 minutes uh, that I've ever, uh, you know, it, it went by well, fast. Bye. All right. Listen, <laughs> it was great. You can go to Gray Zone, uh, gray, the, the Gray Zone of uh, on Twitter, the Gray Zone News on Twitter, Max Blumenthal at Max Blumenthal on Twitter, and you can get access to all of this information uh, at the Gray Zone and what Max is doing. I want to thank you once again uh, and uh, keep up the good work, Max. Max Blumenthal, uh, that's it uh, for this edition of Live on the Fly. Uh, see you next week. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Randy. And I had to jump back in to make an announcement. I almost forgot. This is for. Um, New York City free Assange, you know, April 11th, as I was alluding to earlier with uh, Max, is the anniversary of the uh, break-in of the Ecuadorian embassy and the kidnapping of Julian Assange by the Metropolitan Police in, in London. So uh, the, on that day, over at the uh, British Consulate on 47th and 2nd Avenue, there's going to be uh, let's see, at 11 a.m., there's going to be a rally and a press conference. I will be there. Uh, so uh, please, this is a New York City free Assange having it April 11th, 11 a.m. on 47th and 2nd Avenue. So uh, try to make make it there. It's uh, critical because uh, we're at a critical moment. And I want to thank BAI again for being at the forefront uh, of this and giving me the opportunity uh, to uh, be there for Julian Assange. You've been there from the very beginning. All right, folks, give to WBAI.org. Don't forget. All right, we're going now. I don't even know what the music is. See you next week. They poured across the border. I was cautioned to surrender. This I could not do. I took my gun and vanished
I have changed my name so often. I've lost my wife and children, but I have many friends. And some of them are with me. An old woman gave us shelter, kept us hidden in the garret. Then the soldiers came. She died without a whisper. There were three of us this morning. I'm the only one this evening, but I must go on. The frontiers are my prison. Oh, the wind, the wind is blowing. Through the graves, the wind is blowing. Freedom soon will come. Then we'll come from shadow. Les amants étaient chez moi. Ils me disent signe-toi, mais je n'ai pas peur. Shadow. 